Was Sesame Street the original version of mass distance education? Sonia Manzano, the longtime Maria character on the show, thinks so. She explains next on Global Perspectives. This is Global Perspectives with Pulitzer Prize winning commentator John Bercia. Welcome to Global Perspectives. What is Sesame Street's enduring contribution to education and diversity in America? Sonia Manzano, the longtime Maria character on the show, had a front row seat to the broadcast phenomenon. Welcome to the show, Sonia. Well, thank you. My pleasure to be here. Tell us about Becoming Maria. Well, well, Becoming Maria is a memoir that I've uh, just uh, released. Um, it's called Becoming Maria, Love and Chaos in the South Bronx. And it's about my early upbringing that was uh, uh, quite tumultuous. And it ends right when I started Sesame Street. And in my mind, my, li my life did everything to lead me up to becoming this iconic figure on this remarkable show. Was it what you expected when you first started, or did it really unfold in an amazing way? It unfolded in an amazing way. It was, uh, it came out of, Sesame Street came out of the late 60s. America was an idealistic place. We were going to change society. We were on Sesame Street. We were going to eradicate racism. It was the height of the civil rights um, uh, initiative. We were listening to Malcolm X as well as we were listening to a Martin uh, Luther King Jr. And Sesame Street came out of that. Head Start was the beginning of that. Even President Johnson was creating, wanted to create the Great Society. And uh, Sesame Street was uh, going to close the education gap by having teach cognitive skills through television. And our target audience was African American kids that who were underserved. We were going to help them with their cognitive skills. They were going to start school on an even level with their middle class peers. And uh, we'd all live happily ever after. But then the focus expanded. Yes, then the focus expanded, of course, because as I, as you know, everybody in the 60s had a platform. And Latinos on the West Coast said, wait a minute, you have role models in Susan and Gordon for African American kids. We want role models for the Latino community. And uh, thanks to them, I got cast. And so did Emilio Delgado, the Chicano from uh, the West Coast, and me, the Puerto Rican Maria. And everyone thought that you, the two of you were an item. Yes, everybody for years thought we were really married. And I always tell the joke that uh, we were visiting some place together. And a woman stops us and says, oh, I'm so happy that my kids should see real love on Sesame Street when you two got married. And we said, oh, madam, I'm sorry, we're not really married. And they went, oh, well, as long as you really love each other because uh, their faith in our relationship and in what Sesame Street showed and in what PBS was showing at that time was very important. Tell us about the TV context at that time in terms of diversity. Oh, for heaven's sakes. I was uh, born in uh, the 50s and raised in the South Bronx. And I watched hours of television. I always loved television. And I used to wonder how I could watch television for so many hours and never see any body of color on the screen. As a matter of fact, if you ever saw anybody of color, if you saw a black person, you call the neighbors and say, oh, look, a black person on television. It was a big deal. So you never saw people of color. You certainly didn't see any uh, Latin people on television. Um, uh, the only Latin people that I saw, and this was kind of weird, my mother would take me to see Mexican movies. So I'd see these great, sexy, handsome, Mexican movie stars, leading men. And then on Father Knows Best, they'd be the gardener. They'd have this subservient. And I'd say, is that the same guy? He certainly looks different. And uh, all children try to connect the dots and, and, uh, uh, and figure out life. I used to watch the cowboy shows and wonder where the Native Americans were now. What happened to those people? None of these subjects, of course, were discussed at schools. Mm -hmm. So you never knew, you never discussed a slavery, and you never discussed what happened to those Native Americans that I'm watching on, 
on gun smoke. So, so uh, it, that's the long answer to, uh, to your question. Uh, there were there was no diversity on on um, on television, and uh, the terrible thing about that is that I wondered how I was going to contribute to a society that didn't see me. What part was I going to play? Where was I going to fit in? When did you realize that you were riding a tidal wave? Well, I, as I said, I, I was happy to come of age in the 60s when everybody was, was, uh, was trying to change things and make things better, and we were an idealistic society. And I kept asking the uh, producers of Sesame Street what Maria should be like. And they kept saying, no, we just want you to be just yourself, just a real human being on television, a real Latin person that these kids could relate to. And I think also it was at the time of glamour and glitz on TV, there were a lot of soap opera stars, and they didn't want that. And uh, one day, I'll just tell you a quick little personal story. I'm 21 years old. You don't need a lot of makeup when you're 21. But they made me up to look uh, like a TV doll. And the producer, John Stone, came in. And he grabbed me off the set, dragged me into the makeup room, and he said, I go through all the trouble of casting a real person, and you make her up to look like a Cupid doll. Well, the makeup artist got really nervous. Now I need all the makeup I can get, but in those days I did not. The makeup artist got really nervous, and she, as she's taking my makeup off, I'm looking in the mirror, and I'm thinking, oh, I'm get, I get it. I get it. They really want a real person. And I just ran with it. I knew what my job was. And I, uh, my only misstep was that I was going to be so real, I used a lot of Spanglish on the show. Because that's what the community was using. And my friend Emilio says, what is that word? I never heard that Spanish word. And I realized that it was Spanglish and that to use those words would, be, would exclude my Mexican-American brothers who were not Puerto Rican. And so that was the only misstep that I did. And over time, you became one of the most familiar figures yes. in the world of television. How did that affect you, especially when you went out outside of the studio and everyone thought you were their friend or I their know. relative? I know. People, uh, now that I've retired from Sesame Street, I I mean, I always know. I'm not going to be falsely modest. I knew that I had an impact on people and that people loved me on the show. But um, uh, I know it more now because of the response that I've gotten. And as I said, uh, getting back to Becoming Maria, my book, I describe a, an environment of, I lived in an environment of domestic violence and, and turmoil when I was, when I was growing up. And I, I looked to television for comfort. Now that I've retired, many women and men have written to me saying, you know, my I lived in this crazy environment too, and I watched Sesame Street. Not too, because they didn't know that I was also in that environment. But they would say, I always watch Sesame Street to have an hour of, of uh, love, peace, uh, tranquility. Uh, somebody even wrote to me and said, my mother was schizophrenic, and I watched Sesame Street, and I had a, an hour of calmness, and I wish that you were my mother. And um, I, I went into broadcast as a Latina because I saw you. I never would have thought I mattered or that I counted or that I existed. To the frivolous, like, who's going to fix that toaster in the fix-it shop if you're not going to be there? So I know that I've had a, 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 a wonderful um, impact on, on people. And, and, and thanks to PBS, who, who aired the show at first. Tell us about the impact of the show on education. I think as a part of it, you knew all along that you were engaged in uh, mass sure. distance education, but not everyone else always appreciated. Right, right. It was cognitive skills, as I said, so that the inner city child could um, could start school on the same level as their, as their middle class peers. But it, it didn't close the education gap like that. What happened is everybody stepped up. So, uh, and then we found out that children picked up information at two years old. 
and that there should be programming for a two-year-old at that time would have been unheard of. I mean, ki you know, this was a school for preschoolers when kids started school at five years old. Now they start school, they start preschool, and, and uh, we were amazed that kids picked up information when they were in their diapers. That's why Elmo was such a success, because he's bright and red and one-dimensional, and like a two-year-old can really go for him. When they're five, they want a little nuanced characters, and they go for the bird. But uh, Elmo was certainly a result of, of children picking up information faster than, than we ever uh, could have imagined. You talked about being yourself. Yes. Where did Maria stop and Sonia begin, and vice versa? They, they don't. They're, they're one person. I think that Maria is the more patient Sonia, and uh, uh, maybe the more compassionate Sonia. But everything that uh, Maria is, is certainly myself. When they said, be yourself, I really ran with it. And, uh, uh, but uh, I wanted to add to the education that kids are getting. We, that we started, it wasn't just cognitive skills. We were in, interested in changing society as well. So there were a lot of subliminal messages that we used television to impart. Uh, my best example is uh, walking into the studio and seeing Lena Horne singing It's Not Easy Being Green with Kermit the Frog. Well, I'm thinking, is, are they singing about what I think they're singing about? I mean, that was a very nuanced, mm -hmm. profound, it, I, it, Lena Horne is bringing her profundity of, and her history and what she stands for to this song that seems, the lyrics seem so simple, but it, obviously it's a song about race. But if you're a little kid, it's a song about Kermit being unhappy that he's green as well. So that was a time that, uh, that the, the programming was also very, very interested in, in the subliminal message that you can uh, share through television. Talk to us about the impact of the show in a broader sense beyond TV, beyond the United States even. It's remarkable to me that though it's such an American show with an American sensibility, that uh, people in China love it that people in India love it, that uh, South Africans love the show. And it, why do they love it? If I had the answer to that, <laughs> I'd bottle it and sell it. <laughs> but I'm afraid I don't have the answer to that. I think it has to do with the puppets. They are so irreverent, and I think everybody likes to associate themselves with some kind of zany character. But I think it's also uh, the love that the, the human cast imparts and demonstrates. You were describing a period in the late 60s that was difficult for the nation. What progress have we made since then in terms of race and diversity? And in some ways, are we worse off or as bad off as we were then because we, we've entered this period of coarseness and intolerance, right. or at least the coarseness and intolerance are more noticeable? Right, right. Well, that's, uh, th that's a very, very uh, good question. I think that since we have uh, an African-American president, the racism that runs deep in this country has shown its head in ways that I could not even imagine in the, in the 60s. Uh, the intolerance that we have, we are intolerant of each other. The anger that is underneath the fabric of our society and uh, how people are not educated by their simplistic answers to things. I, I'm shocked. It's like we've lost critical thinking as a nation. We want simple answers like yes or no, good guys and bad guys. It's not that simple. Um, I don't think it's, be I can't think it's simply because we have an African-American president. I think it's always been there, and maybe we're seeing it more. There's a deciding, uh, le uh, obvious lack of empathy also. It's like we don't want to help anybody. It's like it's going to cost us something to, to lend a hand. Um, 
the more religion falls into it, the less we want to help each other. <laughs> uh, so, so it's a very, uh, 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 I think we're living in very tough times and, and um, very coarse times, uh, even when we, even as we try to teach our kids to be nice. Be nice to your friends. Don't be a bully. But then we don't act in the best way. We don't, we don't have the best, we don't show our kids the best behavior possible. And all of this seems contrary to our founding traditions. Yeah. I think of the Statue of Liberty and the hand reaching out to the world. And, and now it's instead of welcoming people, it's, as you said, what's in it for me yeah, if I help you? Exactly. But it's also, we don't even want to help fellow Americans or recognize fellow Americans. Um, and uh, it, it's, uh, it, it, it baffles me. It baffles me. Can we fix this? Well, I don't know. I'm, uh, I, I don't know. I know that um, as far as children goes, we have become a little bit data driven because of computers. We think that if we just download all our information into a kid's brain, it's going to help him. Well, clearly all our information hasn't made us do such a hot job in the, shaping the world. <laughs> so maybe it's not about that. It's maybe also, in addition to that, allowing them to use their imaginations to infer to something like It's Not Easy Being Green with Lena Horne and see what they come up with. Because kids have their own ideas. We always say to kids, where did you get that idea? Ah, they got it from themselves and the way they view the world. And I would, I would uh, certainly encourage that and assume that, um, that they will come up with, with better answers than we have done. You know, it's in our culture. We love that idea that the kids will save the world. In the movie E.T., extraterrestrial Spielberg's movie, we love the moment when the kids are on bicycles and the well-meaning adults are chasing them and all of a sudden the kids take off on their bicycles and the whole audience goes, oh! yeah. it's because we love that feeling that the kids will save us. Well, I, I will nurture that feeling in us <laughs> and give them tools to negotiate the world and create the world they want to live in. Sesame Street has been recently identified as the original MOOC, an uh, <laughs> academic term that uh, Talking about online MOOC, access. What's to, a MOOC? Are you to calling to me a MOOC? <laughs> yeah. That's from, uh, this is a good MOOC. <laughs> it's a good MOOC, not from uh, Mean Street's MOOC. <laughs> but, I, but I'm wondering if Sesame Street had never existed, and you're talking about the gaps that are in place today, how much less educated and how much more coarse might we be? Oh, oh, oh. Don't even go there. <laughs> I think that obviously. Uh, Sesame Street has done so much towards diversity. People have come to me and said, you're the first, you know, in a, they said, I was raised in Idaho and you're the first Latin person I ever saw. And I say to myself, is that, is, is, could that be possible? Sometimes I think that I'm not the, I'm not the first Latin person they ever saw, but the, I'm the first one they saw as a human being, mm -hmm. as a real mm -hmm. person. And I think that I was able to, to do that with Sesame Street. But getting back to MOOC, Sesame Street used television as a technology as a way to teach, harnessing the power of television to reach millions of children with education. And technology is always ahead of us. We always create stuff and then we don't know what to do with it. What's this good for? Mm, I don't know, reading for kids or something. So I think that now technology is running ahead of us, but we're using it as, I never heard of MOOC uh, until recently, uh, to, to get information out there for those who want it. Mm -hmm. So that's a great use of it. Tell us about your other writing, because you've been, been involved in so many different types. Well, uh, I wrote for Sesame Street for many years. Uh, that's how I started writing. And um, now I'm writing prose. So I wrote uh, uh, Becoming Maria, Love and Chaos in the South Bronx, and another and a picture book called Miracle on 133rd Street, which uh, is based on a true story. My, my uh, parents 
one time wanted to make a pork roast, a whole little suckling pig. And it didn't, for Christmas Eve, and it didn't fit in the oven. <laughs> so they had to take it to a bakery and have it cooked there and then brought back home. I remember the whole family. There's a whole to do about doing this thing. So I wrote this fantasy story about uh, a neighborhood who's down in the dumps and grumpy all about Christmas until the father brings home the roast. And the aroma of this roast has a magical influence on all the community and gets them into the Christmas spirit. All of the writing that I do is based on my childhood or events that happened to me in the South Bronx. I was greatly inspired by Frank McCourt when he wrote Angela's Ashes because that was the most miserable childhood I could ever read about, his Irish upbringing. Plus, he was able to uh, illustrate that childhood with humor and love and empathy. Mm -hmm. And I thought... I had misery, I have humor, <laughs> I have love and empathy. And I decided to try my, my, uh, my hand at that uh, with my memoir. And my book before this, uh, The Revolution of Evelyn Serrano, is about the, uh, a girl coming of age in 1969 in when Latinos were first making political stands. What is your focus now after Sesame Street? Is it mostly on children? Is it mostly on that next generation? Or do you have a broader focus? I, I tell you, I can't, I can't get away from kids. I, uh, I'm uh, helping to establish a museum in the Bronx, Bronx Children's Museum. It's the only borough without a children's museum. And those are the kids who need a museum mostly. I, I, w I would hope to continue to help children uh, in, um, in whatever arenas are afforded me. I will continue to write for them. And um, there's always stuff to do, I can tell you that. There's no lack of finding initiatives. Do you have a private life? Because you're so familiar, you probably can't go anywhere without being recognized. And people want to be next to you, want to be photographed with you. Uh, you're their friend, you're their neighbor, you're their relative yes. in so many ways. Yes, but really, I like to think of myself as the invisible celebrity. Because they think that they know me, a lot of times people say, like, hmm, who does that look familiar? Like, they think I'm, like, either their high school teacher or the cashier at the supermarket. I'm sort of in their, their uh, ken of knowledge. So uh, unless people know that I'm appearing there, I could walk, I could take the subway, no problem, and not be accosted. Great. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Sonia Manzano. Thank you. My pleasure. And thank you. For Global Perspectives, I'm John Bercia, and we'll see you next time.